you are in the right place if you're here to learn about making the homepages better for websites. Uh, a talk I call Don't Put It Off on the Homepage. Uh, quick thank you to all the sponsors of this conference. We love sponsors. I want to say a few quick words about myself. So I've been working on the web for a super long time. I've worn many hats over the years since we came there from designer, developer, to UX specialist. Um, I'm a big Drupal enthusiast. I'm actually a lead organizer, lead organizer for Twin Cities Drupal Camp, which is in Minneapolis, uh, mid-September. So if you're interested in that, or in the future, it's twincitiesdrupal.org. Um, on Drupal.org, I have Twitter and other places on Minneapolis Camp, which, again, not surprisingly, that's where I'm from. My new job is working for a web agency called Electric Citizen. We've been working with the civic sector, especially government, since 2012. We are a team of Drupal specialists, which again makes a lot of sense for us to be here today. And um, look for me uh, throughout the conference afterwards if you want to learn more about what we do. All right, so I just thought I'd quick show of hands. Uh, who here? Uh, feels good about their organization's current homepage. <laughs> it's hard, maybe it's hard to feel good about a homepage, but, but uh, it's not an So, a matter of um, for the rest of you, maybe you don't feel good or you're just not sure. Uh, I'm just also curious who enjoys working with their site today. So, a few more hands, that's good. Um, so, for those who don't like their current homepage, or even those who do, hopefully, we can learn some tips uh, to bring back to you and your team. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick uh, overview of what this talk is about. Uh, making a better homepage for your website and how you can do that through better user experience practices, more strategic use of content, and more effective use of design. And uh, I was thinking I'm going to cover topics as you see here because I created my net. Uh, why the homepage specifically? Where do we make things? Uh, where do things go wrong? And ways we can make it better. And uh, I wanted to start this talk by thinking, bringing it back to the physical world. So think of your content in a large warehouse, all stacked up, and you've got uh, maybe a small warehouse or a huge warehouse of content. And how are you going to make this fit in a room? All right. So let's start with a, maybe a, a smaller sized example, a living space. So I think the last time you, you stayed somewhere or visited some place where everything was really clean and neat and order and purposeful. And it was just clear what you were supposed to do when you walked in the room. And so in this example, there's only so many options. It's clear there's a couch you can sit on. That's your primary purpose, I would say. Your secondary purpose, you can sit on those very little stools. Um, or maybe uh, play a game at, at, uh, at the coffee table. Um, I don't know if your place looks like this, mine doesn't, but uh, if you stayed in an Airbnb, uh, I frequently see it like this. So, um, another example is like a restaurant or coffee shop. So, here's an example where you walk into a, a space, and again, this is physical space, but we're going to relate this to the virtual world. I don't, you don't need so much of instruction on where to go or what your primary purpose is, right? There's a, there's a counter, you're clearly designed to walk up and place your order. And then there's secondary content as well as like, uh, you can sit in a chair along the wall or, um, you know, check out the plant wall. But there's a, a clear order to the space. And then thirdly, uh, maybe a hotel copy, which I checked into yesterday and I'm guessing a lot of you did too. Where the primary path is laid out in front of you, it's a front desk. You go there to check in. So there's lots of secondary content to this space. It might be an exercise room or a pool, or it could be um, a place to eat, right? But the point is, when you first enter the space, they're not trying to tell you everything that's available in this hotel. The first thing is, let's help get you oriented. Let's help you with that primary task. So. Uh, let's think of some opposite experiences. So maybe it's a room in your house, both time. Um, I think of a grocery store as a different kind of experience, right? So this is a, 
a room where there's so many different signs and, and messaging at every aisle reaching for my attention. It's got so much to offer that very few people, the first time they go in the grocery store, understand this is where I'm supposed to go, this is what I'm supposed to do. It's a learned experience, right? But when you're on the web, people don't, you don't have the luxury of waiting for people to understand what to do. And lastly, I think of an antique store as a good example. This space is is pure chaos, right? Uh, so that's part of the fun for some people, and uh, I get that. But in this space, there's no primary purpose. There's no top call to action. It's just go explore and have fun. And there's nothing wrong with that, but when we're talking about websites, talking about government sites, people aren't there to just explore and have fun there. They're to get in and get out quickly. And so what kind of experience are you going to give them when they come to your site? So let's move on to the web. Uh, I won't spend much time on this site. I've had, this is an example of a bad web design, if you've ever seen that. If you search for it, this is sort of a Norwegian version of Craigslist, just what I, I believe, where they're giving you a Overwhelming amount of content on the home page. You have no, word, no idea where to begin. This is that antique store experience, right? If you have time to explore, it can be fun. Um, but what about a site like this? I, I think that Wayfair.com is, is a more designer based site, and they have you know, fairly nice products. But when I look at the site, um, it's laid out, it follows good design conventions, it chunks content out, it uses white space, the fonts. Are legible, but think of the overwhelming amount of content when you come to a site like this. You know, the pages, you just you can scroll down and it's going on and on and on. And if you were to get to the navigation, you know, it's, it's extremely long on top level navigation. There's about 10 items or more. And then if you were to peek into one of them to see what's available, it's an overwhelming amount of choice. And I understand that large content is the reality for some sites, and this is a solution. But if you don't need to go this route, I think it's a better user experience, and so we'll look at some ways to alleviate that. Likewise, apologies if this site involves any of you, but I just wanted to find a government site that I think has some challenges. You know, it's not a bad looking site by any means. Um, I like the colors and the human faces, but Again, if this was a room that I walked into, where would I begin? I've got a navigation across the top of the right side. It's got at least eight items. Within each of those, there's a drop down with dozens of options. There's a secondary map above the search bar, another eight options. You might think the primary call to action is this green button, but that's just one of 10 slides that you can go through. And then below that, there's five you know, audience-based links with their own tabs and categories of content. So this could all look at single user's screen, single page, and um, it's just, it feels overwhelming. So what users want from the homepage, I would argue, is they want clarity and they want purpose. Uh, they want to know, first of all, is this the right place? Does this site have the content that I need? Does it demonstrate that it does? Is it inspiring confidence in the way it's laid out, that they can trust you? Can they remember users are there to quickly scan and move on? They're not there to explore if they don't need to, uh, and they certainly do not want to. So clarity and purpose, and how does that happen? Well, we'll look at some examples. So as we're beginning our quest for a better homepage, um, I thought of a few questions that you might have, like, why should you care by the homepage? Where, where specifically do things go wrong? And then finally, how to make them better. All right, so first of all, why should you care? I assume you know, all of you are here today because presumably you do care in some way. That's why you're here to learn, and that's good. Um, but why the homepage itself? And you know, what does it say about your, your site? So all of us are generally here with organizations that are there to serve people, especially government audience, we're looking at serving the public. So it's not something, it's not about your internal team, although that may be something you struggle with. It's ultimately about your audience, and that audience coming to your website to do something. Um, 
why the homepage itself? Because clearly, not every visitor starts at your front door. There's many pathways into a site, right? But there are many reasons it's important. Uh, first of all, it's almost always one of the most heavily trafficked pages in your site. It's the chance to make a first impression in your homepage. So users are going to make their mind up very quickly. Do you have content that I need? Or maybe you might have content that I need. And you know, can I trust you? Is this is your one chance to often engage that user before they leave and go somewhere else. So that's what we're really focused on the homepage. Every page on your site should link back to that homepage. It's that critical touch point. It's a safe place uh, to, for users when they, if they found your site through another area, they are not sure where to go next, they're going to go back to that homepage to look for guidance. But I like this quote from a UX expert with the Nielsen Norman Group talking about a well designed homepage that guides users towards their goals with clarity and precision while effectively reflecting the brand identity and insight offerings. So the bold words are my emphasis. You're guiding users with clarity and precision to understand what your site has to offer and you're reflecting your brand while you do so. Having a homepage that's clean and effective is going to benefit your audience which in turn benefits your organization. So some of these things are uh, intuitive, right? It's going to help your visitors find their way, and it's going to better reflect your organization. I want to particularly highlight the last point, which is one of my, uh, which is easier for your editors to maintain. So a super busy, crowded homepage is just going to be more content for you to maintain and update, and it's not going to necessarily benefit your users. So let's find ways to make this smaller. All right, so we've looked at home pages, uh, why they're important, and now I want to kind of go through some examples of where home pages can go wrong. Uh, we've talked why we're especially focused on the home page itself, and I'd like to talk about some of the common obstacles, or what I'm going to call monsters, that you may encounter that are preventing you from having a good home page. So here's the list that I'm going to go through. Um, about navigation and such. So let's get started. Monster number one, the huge nav monster, the huge navigation monster. So, so many redesign projects, they come to, come to our organization and presumably others, they, they talk about a bad user experience. Users can't find their way. The site navigation is confusing. It's very common. It's too long. It's too focused on internal departments or organizations. Um, so again, remember this example from earlier, like the Wayfair site, super long navigation. It's going to be much harder for a user to quickly understand where they need to go. Here's an example of client say where they started. This primary navigation is, is fairly simple. Um, however, it does it does uh, uh, maybe focus once you dig into it. It's more on internal departments versus what the public wanted to see, and then when you um, when you loaded one of the dropdowns, there was just so many links that users felt lost or overwhelmed. And so the solution for that, in the redesign, is taking that same navigation, it's not dramatically you know, rebuilt from, from the ground up, but it's tweaking it to make it better. It's using languages that your target audience better understands, like things to do, or getting around, as opposed to you know, thinking in terms of government department. And then for the drop-downs, we're reducing the amount of choice, or at least hiding it, so that when a user chooses to drop down one of the menus, they've got a limited set of choice that's targeting the most commonly desired areas. So we don't have to show everything at once. People can, if they choose, they can view all the services, but we give them a choice. So taming the, the huge app monster, a good rule of thumb you might have heard before, four to six main navigation items is a place to start. It doesn't, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's just a great number that will fit on any number of size screens and will be manageable to your users. Okay, so um, I also start eliminating your drop-down navigation. 
uh, a shorter secondary nav, which is the place in the upper right, if you're following standard practices. So maybe you have an about us or contact us, contact us, that's fine, but don't have like eight items up there. Um, don't try to do everything in your navigation. All right, the second monster, the giant content monster. And this monster appears when you're not sure where your content belongs, so you can put it all on the home page. And when there's, or when there's different departments or people in your organization, and they all view their content as the most important, and they want to make sure people see it, so you put it all on the home page. And the home page just grows and grows into uh, well, it towers over the city, right? Um, and threatens to overwhelm everything. So here's an example of a site we've been consulting on uh, that's an example of a giant content monster. The site starts with a simple enough navigation, just a few items, which is good. And it's not a bit wordy of a site that you have at the very top, if you can see it, it's not pixelated. Um, but then from there, you, you're presented with, do you want to do a job search? Okay, great. But wait, there's also a call out with a call to action button. And then you keep scrolling. And then it's, what about these three call outs and these things? And then there's events and dates, and you can filter by them, which is a helpful practice, right? But does it all have to be a homepage? You go down further, there's training programs, again, filters. I go in the general sense, but do they have to be here? And then there's another call out with buttons. There is connected services. Is it just two? No, because those are scrolling. You can scroll through multiple options. And then further down the page, you've got, hey, do you want to learn about a blog? Do you want to hear about this in the news? And all good content, but when you put it all together, it really, oh, it's it. Oh, it, <laughs> it, it, it gets to be a bit much. Now, of course, you don't want to do the opposite of that, which is the anti-content officer where uh, all that says is, hey, search the site, and that's it. <laughs> um, all right, so taking the content monster, um, take the hard step of limiting your primary message to your primary audience. I know all of you probably have multiple audiences. This is one of the harder steps to take, is to determine who that primary audience is and really focus that on them for the prime real estate of your homepage. You can still do other things. You can you can have secondary content, but not too much, or it will just get lost in the noise. I also say don't fall back on traps like having a carousel or slider where you think, oh, I can just reach 10 different audiences through the slider, and each one will be happy with an individual slide because no one will read those or look at them. As the same goes for you know, accordions and tabs, if you use those devices, they're very useful to a degree, but they can easily be overused, and again, not something you can entirely rely on. All right, so third monster, I the time here, uh, the lost audience monster. All right, so another common problem with homepage is forgetting who the site is for. It's very common to find sites in government or other organizations, it's not just government, or areas where the navigation and content is written for your internal audience and not the end users you serve. So remember, the site is not for you and your organization, it's for your end users. That might sound obvious, but it's very common to fall into this trap. So if you do want the site to be for both audiences, consider doing an internet where you can pull off that internal content off to its own site, away from the public content, it makes it clearer and easier for everyone. Here's an example, I'll just bring an example I pulled off the internet, looking at this, this government site where they're listing popular agencies, right? And so I looked at this and thought, does the average public user know what each of these does? Do the logos mean anything to anyone? And so I doubt that that means something. What they're wanting is a particular service or outcome, not just the name of the department. So this other example um, happens to be the state where I'm from, but that's beside the point. Uh, it is, um, you know, they're also highlighting popular agencies here in this blue bar, but 
they're giving it a, you know, a more human approach. They're saying the name, they're showing an image that provides the user context, they're giving a short summary. So again, I think that's just more useful to, to the end user and remembering your audience than just a bunch of random logos. So again, to help find your way from the lost audience monster, remember your audience, make sure you understand who they are and what they want and their goals, and then revisit that periodically. You know, it may be that you knew who your audience was when you first built the current site, but years have passed, different people have come and gone in your organization. It's time to, if you don't have it well documented, make sure it's well documented, and see if it's changed, because um, it's important to uh, remember that and consider moving to an internet uh, for that internal content. All right, I got two more of these. So, I'm trying to remember what time did I start? 1.50, okay, okay. Um, so the faceless monster. So, outside of the logo in the upper left, does that homepage say anything about who you are or stand out from other pages on your site? So your homepage, every homepage should be visually distinct. It should be obvious. This is a special page. Um, that will help your users know they're in the right place. It says, should say quickly who you are and what steps you can take on, the, on this. It's the front door to your site. So remember, we're not running an antique store or a grocery store. We want to be more like that slick coffee shop with the or hotel lobby that this lets us know who we are, where we are, and what we're supposed to do. So here's an example of a site where the page, the screenshot on your left, that's the home page. So it has a large welcome message, it says who we are, and has a few quick calls to action, and it's got a, a large full-width full image, whereas the interior pages on your right, they follow a different pattern. And the point I'm making here is that the home page on this site is visually distinct. You know it's a special page. Whereas in this other example, you know, it's it's not quite as clear to me. In some ways, they're using some of the same elements as the previous example, but just the way they choose to emphasize them, the way they choose to display them through design, it becomes less clear that this page on your left up here is visually distinct from any other page of the site that you know you're on the home page. Um, the other point I'm making with this um, faceless monster is say who you are and what you do. You know, it's it's maybe it's obvious, maybe there's certain sites or organizations where this isn't important, but I don't think it's ever harmful and it's certainly helpful for things like the users who may not know, it reassures them they're in the right place, it helps with search engines. So, and this doesn't mean a despite the what I just showed you in a second ago, it doesn't mean just say welcome to Department of Fun. It it, it should say more than that. Um, so, in this example, it's telling you the pollution control agency. Here's who we serve and what we do in a short phrase. So the previous version of the site, it didn't say that. It's not a bad link site, but it led with a, a news story and then a bunch of call to actions on the right. And so it wasn't necessarily clear to the user what they were to do. Well, in this example, it also helped with the navigation. It presented content in the ways that the internal department thought about it. Is this an air issue? Is this a, a water issue? Is this you know, a waste issue? Whereas the general public, they may not know. And so in the new site, we put those together and then guide users through a different way. We're not assuming um, a certain level of knowledge going into the page. So remember to emphasize the unique value of your site on that home page. Um, yeah, this other example, again, we're leading with, here's who we are, here's what we do. Um, another part of not being faceless is these samples of content. So in this example, once you scroll up the page, there's a lot of content to this site, right? And so what you need to do is not list all of it 
and you're not listening quite a bit, but we distilled it down to four categories, as you see here. And then a user can quickly scan a few sentences for each one and some examples. So they get a sense, oh, this is what this site has to offer without going into overwhelming detail about any single one. So remember, to, with the faceless monster, um, visually distinct homepage um, from the other pages in their site, clear statement about who you are and what you do, it's a great place to start, and then includes some sample content, not too much, but if users a taste of what to expect. And our last monster today is the maze monster. So does your homepage make it clear where to go next? All right, so here's an example of a, a, a homepage where you look at it and you say, well, what's the next step? And you might say, oh, well, it's uh, a request a transcript. But no, that's just one of many slides that are loading on the page. So then you stand your eye up, you see, again, an overly long, numerous amount of navigation to wade through. You don't really get a clear sense maybe of what to do next. So keeping it simple in this other example, we can start with, there's a short statement of what we are, what we do, and then boom, there's a big button that says start the guide. So there's a hint, you can't maybe see it on this screen, but there's a hint that there's more content below, and that's important to let users know that. And so they can scroll to find more, or they can go to the navigation, but we're at least offering them a choice of path to start. And so on the previous iteration of this site, you know, I guess the primary call to action is search. And that's not a terrible place to start, but it's not as specific as the new version of the site. It's not being as opinionated maybe about where it wants you to go. And I think that, that can really help your users not get lost in the domain. So remember, if you can have that primary call to action, limit the amount of choice or decision making and offer a clear path on that location. So a few more monsters just to touch on. You know, a lack of content governance can be a problem. Does your organization train users on editors on how to use content for the web? Or is it just a, a free-for-all? You know, that can be dangerous. Uh, is anyone measuring what's working on the site? You know, do you know if people are engaging with your navigation and, and in what ways? Um, is there uh, a voice in the shadows that you might have experienced, right? Where, where you, you have a web team that are going very far and, and well along to building your homepage, and then a well-intentioned, perhaps, person from the, from the shadows comes in and says, no, let's, let's throw this on the homepage instead, and they were involved in the process. So that's always a danger. It's a monster to watch out for. Um, again, going back to content strategy, governance about tone, length of sentences, phrases, and then also feedback. You know, you're not selling a product, uh, so you don't have sales metrics to fall back on. So how do you know if your homepage is a success? What kind of feedback loops do you offer? Is there a way for, do you do user testing? Do you um, do surveys? You have to know what's working. So let's recap. What, uh, how we can make things better. So this is the list we just went through. Visually distinct, call to action, samples of content, saying who you are, keeping it simple. Uh, a few other things to avoid. Users don't want a page that loads slowly. What loads slowly? A page with spires, a pair of parasites, uh, lots of embedded videos, social media feeds. You don't need those on your homepage. Let's not use them and slow things down. There's also some accessibility issues to having autoplay videos or animation. So I like to make sites more interesting, but make it more lightweight and optional. I wanted to say uh, just a word about the fold. So for those who, are, and I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with the concept, a physical newspaper has a fold content that is seen above the, that fold in the page is the one that's most visible. I would like to say this isn't important anymore. However, because um, users are willing to scroll, that is definitely a change. But as recently as 2010, so 80% of users were not scrolling past the fold. That's dropped to 50% or less in more recent studies. But that's still a significant portion that is not. 
In our own studies of like heat maps, we've seen that experience where scrolling really drops off as you get on the homepage. So just keep that in mind. Make sure your most important content is near the top. And if your homepage is not overly long, it won't be as big of an issue with scrolling. You can't necessarily assume that users will invest the time to go through it all. Also avoid what is called a false floor, and that's where it looks like your page is ending because you have like a full with video on the initial screen load. Users need to have a hint or a clue that there's more content to be found. All right, so bringing it all home. Uh, next steps, assuming you agree the home page is critical to, critical to your organization's success. Um, what do you need to do next? So here's some practices to maintain a good home. I mentioned this a moment ago. Uh, has anyone done heat map tracking on their home page before, some of you? And so you could use a tool like uh, Crazy Egg or Hotjar, visually showing you where clicks are happening on the home page and, uh, and where they're not. So in this example, no one was looking at the news on the So they tell us that's not as important to, to the users. Uh, and so that can be a really uh, great way to, to get a sense of what's working. Um, other examples, site map testing. So using a tool like TreeJack, you put up a generic site navigation to your users, and then you can observe how well they're finding their way, and that can produce items like this, where we'll be able to on the back end see, this was the question, how did people perform as an internal audience and an external on this example, we measured both. What paths were they taking? and what changes do we need to make to the navigation on the homepage to, to help your end user. So a few other helpful ideas. Personalization, I think this is a really intriguing idea as a, a promise where you, know, you don't have to have a, you don't have to or want to have a carousel or slider that speaks to five different audiences because users generally don't interact with those. But imagine if your site could present that content to that particular audience based on who the site thought they were. So that seemed to have a lot of promise as an idea of making the homepage more effective for a particular group of users. Obviously, it's not an easy flip on a switch kind of thing, but it's something to explore. Um, it has required maintaining some kind of tracking in your audience, and, and there are some privacy concerns. Um, if you can anonymize the data in some way. But I think that that's an interesting newer thing to, to, to consider with a better homepage. Likewise, um, remember, you know, the homepage is, is critical, but it doesn't have to be your only big landing page. You can do other target landing pages and drive traffic there. So if you were concerned about a particular event or a particular user group, but it wasn't applying to that primary user group or what you do day to day, Make a targeted landing page away from the homepage, direct your traffic or, or links to that page. Don't just push it all together on a single homepage. Um, lastly, I just, for kind of fun, I just put AI in there. Honestly, I don't have any great tips for that. <laughs> I just wanted to consider that. I mean, it could do some help with summarizing your text, of course, but to my knowledge, there's not to date a tool that will generate a homepage for you, although I could be proven wrong. All right, so we made it through. I kind of lost track of where I was in the talk, but that gives us time for, for questions if we need to. Uh, hopefully I've been able to give you things to think about for a more effective homepage, some tips, and strategies to avoid some of those common issues or monsters. And uh, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, answer your questions. What was that side map tracker tool? Oh, the, the tool for, for working with navigation, you mean? Um, so we, I think the name might have changed. We always call it TreeJack, but it's through Optimal Workshop is the name of the company, and they, and they sell the tool, and uh, it's a tool we use quite frequently in client sites when we're testing that navigation. Um, yeah, you on the left, and then you on the right? My right? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I have like, two points for a question. 
first on um, key packaging. I don't know a lot about it, but I am curious about the thing. When you show the key packaging, is that where someone actually clicks? Yes. It's not like they, so you can't differentiate, like someone might look at something on a home page and then click on a certain item. Right, it's tracking the user's movements. And so, I, you're not very good at asking this question, but it, it's making me think of how this works with the mobile user. I mean, the user touches the screen. I know I know there is mobile because we've looked at it, but, but it's, it's not necessarily the, the physical cursor click, but it's where their finger touches. But yeah, it's just measuring where the activity is. In this particular example, it'll show, there's other screens that will show you where people are just clicking even away from specific links, so you get a sense of what users think is a link. But they it's not, or they track what are called rage clicks, where people just keep clicking on something, expecting it to happen, and nothing happens. Um, so we just did a key pack on the primary internet community. Yeah. And as you built in a big internet project for three years now. And um, it had similar results. The search box and the top five top of page menus, which do have some drop downs in them. Were the, were the top things that lit up, but not the news items and the other pieces of information on the landing page. However, yeah. you can't really correlate that people do read them right. because they're just there to be That's read. true. They're That's not true. there to necessarily be clicked on. And um, so the, the comment, if you didn't hear, was we're talking about using a heat map tracker and how um, it does give you certain information. It's not the same as like an eye tracking test that you might do in a usability lab where you're actually seeing where the user's eye is looking. So it's, it's a limited amount of data. It did bring up a point I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, when you're looking at your metrics for the site, it's important not to just see the numbers, but then have some understanding of what they mean. So what I mean by that is we might be looking at a government site where it shows people spent, used to spend five seconds on this page and now they spent two or whatever, it, 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 maybe that's not the right numbers, but the idea is, does a user spending a longer period of time on a page, is that good? You know, maybe it's not. Maybe it's meaning that they can't find where they're going, and, the, and that's why they're stuck on this page for so long, whereas we made some changes to a government site, it was a city site, and suddenly users were spending less time on the site, and we had to just do some research to say, is this, this is a good change? And ultimately, we determined it was. Um, but the only way you can find that out is to go beyond the metrics and maybe do some surveys or ask some user feedback or user testing. So I have secondary for you. Secondary. Secondary landing pages. Um, during COVID, the landing pages were much more popular than they were before. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, regional offices have historically been very independent, and they don't like to be told what to do. However, during COVID, what happened was uh, everybody stood up COVID study immediately, March, April, 2020. But then, when the information was not getting properly updated, headquarters got all the complaints migrants. And so then they made an executive decision and told everyone, we're making one site for the whole agency, and all the information posted there, you can do a banner that says like what's the um, current you know status in your location like mm -hmm. high transmission rate, low transmission, but in terms of CDC information and all of that, it's going on the national site. And that was probably in the history of my knowledge of the agency, the only time everyone agreed. And so that became the secondary thing information on the primary page linking to the COVID landing page where from the whole agency all the COVID Yeah. So if I if I understood you correctly that, that example you were giving about a COVID related um, content was you were finding some success by moving some of that some of that content onto its own dedicated landing page and not all of it and not not just putting it all on the home page. So good. I mean, the home page had a link to the... The home page linked to the secondary landing page, but yeah, you did try to say it all on the same page. And then, the, the, then there was no misinformation. Like, they weren't updating in a timely manner, all of these kind of things. Right, right. Um, 
Yeah, uh, let's see, I'll start there. Yes. How, how do you get organizations to agree what goes on the homepage? And did I have a? It's funny. I, I I feel like I was I was worried about going over because I was quite long when I did this in testing, and now I have lots of time. So I didn't seem to remember a slide. Maybe I lost over it. Um, but regardless, um, I think that um, you know getting people to agree. There's a couple of strategies to that. One is making sure you have your stakeholders in the room when you do that process. Avoid the voices from the shadow wherever possible. Make sure people agree. If you're not in the room making these, having these conversations, you don't get to have a say in this. Um, and likewise, that doesn't mean bring 20 people to the, to the team either. You still have to limit it. Someone has to be a point person. You have to have that, that decision-making process distilled down. I would also say that, you know, this is a bit of a plug maybe for, for someone like myself at an agency, but it's, there's some truth to it. Sometimes getting an outsider's perspective is, is the key. And for, for, I think for good reasons, but there's also a bit of a psychological aspect to it. You know, this is someone that, that spends their life thinking about these problems over many years, so they do have a level of expertise that can help sort of frame those decision making and maybe weigh in a little more heavily because they're not distracted by you know what my department does. They're seeing the bigger picture. So um, but I also just think that that can can really help unlock the key sometimes is just when you're when you're inviting is bringing in that outsider to help help uh, mediate. Um, back there in the far left. Um, I'm just curious Carousels or sliders on secondary landing pages. The first part of your question, uh, can you repeat that again for me quickly? Yeah, like if there's, you know, I mentioned the pandemic, to me, or, you know, groups and organizations. So just in general, sure. uh, do you think that we have, similarly, I do an EPA, there are many different departments, and each department has a different audience. I think, I think, so the question is, you know, does this, sometimes a, a site has many different audiences and different departments, and, and so they look at using secondary landing pages, but does that get overwhelming or, or hard to manage over time? Is that kind of accurate? And so what I say to that is, go back to that idea of remembering first your audience who shouldn't care less what the department is, and more of what they need to do. And so how can you structure your site around that? And then if it does require, um, if you find yourself with, I don't know, a dozen different audiences, then, and each one has its own weight and its importance, so it's a very large organization, then yeah. Um, can you do multiple sites? Can you link to them? Can you do secondary pages? I'd say that there's still, there's definitely a value in doing it that way as opposed to you can't you can't use that home page to tell people about everything. So you're gonna to have to make some hard choices. And then for your second part, which <laughs> I'm already forgetting, uh, the secondary nav uh, or secondary landing pages, um, the carousels. So in my in my opinion and, and, and many uh, expert opinions, if you're gonna use a carousel, use it for something that's just better suited for carousel. So don't use it for communicating messages. If you want to, if, it, if it's something a user decides to explore, like let's say you have like a series of quotes or testimonials, it's not critical the user see each one, right? 
but if they choose to, they can flip through them, and then that's a good use of the carousel. Or likewise, it's an image gallery. It doesn't matter that I'm flipping through it, it's just extra content that if I choose. But if you're expecting a user to find their way through carousel, then you're going to be disappointed. There's a question in the back. Yeah, um, there's a question around the uh, data making decision making is more like direction for the home page. So lots of times when people have to kind of be able to talk somewhere else, you know, like you said, those shadows are coming to the home page. And I found that sometimes data can help support them in the events. But also, does that tell the whole story, or would you say you should probably so I believe the question is: Does is you you're using data to determine what's most effective for that home page? But does that tell the whole story, right? And it doesn't, because like in that example I gave earlier, it's telling you users are spending more time on the site than they used to. Is that is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? You don't know just from the data, so you're going to have to do other data. Uh, gathering and that might be, you know, a big proponent of doing user testing. Uh, and, and for smaller groups, just look for patterns and how people are using the site and things that can be improved. And then for the broader questions, um, how our audiences are receiving it, look at doing surveys, maybe you have like feedback mechanisms on the site, you're asking people, of, uh, giving them opportunity to share their thoughts as they're browsing. Um, so there's definitely more engagement that has to happen beyond just looking at the analytics. All right. Uh, anything else? I guess uh, we can wrap it there. And uh, if you have any other questions, let me know.